The sixth round of the championship saw the teams return to the Slovakia ring. And once again, it was a strong weekend for the Vita One racing team. There was a bit of a kerfuffle in the mid-pack, which meant Fred Makovicki picked up damage on his McLaren at the first corner. And as the cars came down into turn three, Makovicki lost control of his McLaren through the chicane, getting all out of shape, just about keeping it out of the crash barriers. But that was the end of the Hexus McLaren's race, much to the disappointment of Philippe Dumas. Up at the front, Yama Berman was controlling the race, but the battle was on for second place. Mark Basseng losing out in the end to Nicky Mayer Mounhoff through the tight infield section. Mayer Mounhoff forcing his way past the alinkel.com Munich Motorsports Mercedes, or Telly and Basseng then coming to blows into turn eight. Basseng holding on to that third position for the time being. There was also a battle between the second Mercedes and second Audi. This time Oliver Jarvis managed to find his way past the number 37 Mercedes, driven at the time by Nicky Pastorelli on the run into turn two. It was retirement for Enzo Eid after just nine laps, picking up a puncture on his Ferrari. And at the pit stop, Yelma Berman handed over to his teammate Michael Bartels. The pit stop was slick and they came out comfortably in the lead of the race, ahead of their teammates. The 17 car now driven by Matthias Lauda. Stefano Telly lost out in the pit stops when he handed over to Lawrence Van Thor. They had the pace to be challenging for the win, but ended up coming out in fourth position, only just behind the 38 car of Marcus Winkelhock. Oliver Jarvis then started to make some moves, that position getting past Tony Volanda to take fifth position. Alvaro Perem was pushing a little bit too hard, and that ripped up the rear bumper of his McLaren, meaning the safety car had to come out when the debris was removed. Matthias Lauda was struggling when the safety car came in, and he lost that second position to Marcus Winkelhock, but it was Michael Bartels and Yelma Berman who took the championship race victory and extended their lead at the top of the Drivers' Championship at the Slovakia ring. Audi have struggled since the opening round in Nagaro, but finally, last time out in Slovakia, they started to get things back on track, finishing the championship race in fourth and fifth. Here this weekend in Russia. Uh, after Nagaro, we had a difficult time. In Slovakia, we were getting back on the pace, but where we unfortunately made some errors, which cost us a good result. Uh, so yeah, let's hope that we have the same pace in Slovakia, maybe a little bit better, and. Uh, and go back uh, to the podium. Michael Bartels and Yelma Berman come into this weekend leading the Drivers' Championship in their number 18 car. But in the number 17 car, Nicky Mermanov and Matthias Lauda have started to get into their rhythm a little bit more. But Lauda's preparation for this weekend hasn't exactly been ideal. Normally, you always arrive a day before the free practice, but uh, I had a delay with my flight. And Arrived too late, I went straight to the hotel, and this morning I just went out for the first time. Um, to be honest, yeah, it's it's new for everyone, and, and the, the first couple of laps you just take it easy and, and, and learn the line. But we're all professionals, and normally it's always um, it's easy to learn a track for me. It's not that difficult. A day, of course, of Ferrari. They were at a loss to explain their lack of pace last time in the Slovakia ring. In June, Tony Valander and Philippe Salacuada won the qualifying race, but last time out, sixth was the best they could manage in the championship race. Philippe Salacuada reckons that this circuit might suit the 458 a little better. Uh, hopefully, the weather forecast stays, stays good, no rain. Uh, we have different BOP for us, so which should help us. At Ford, it's an all-new driver pairing. In 2011, Benjamin Larich and Iman Ibrahim were competing against each other in FIA Formula 2. But this weekend, they're teammates at the Sun Red Racing team. 
Benjamin Larish has already competed in GT1 this season, but it's going to be a steep learning curve for Ibrahim. No, it's my first time in a GT car, my first time in a left-hand drive as well, so it's all new, but I think we're not that far off for, 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 for the amount of laps we've done. Um, you know, so far, the car's been running, we've done a good amount of laps today. Uh, let's see, we just need to make a few more changes for qualifying, especially on the tire twisty bits. That, that seems to be our main problem. Yeah. Unfortunately, there won't be any rider engineering Lamborghinis out this weekend in Russia after an incident at the Slovakia ring last time out. Albert von Turn and Taxis can explain what happened. The steering a little bit was not making the tra trajectory as it was supposed to, so I went a little bit wide on the exit and I went a little bit off the line, therefore got a little bit of oversteer, had to open, uh, use the track until the, um, to go outside of the curbs on the green bits and which was okay as well but unfortunately the car got a little bit of a got a little bit of a hit on the curbs because it's quite low and that that disturbed the rear of the car another bit so i had to open up and i couldn't come out and, and needed to take a bit of the grass and on the grass it was just uh, i was just a passenger from then on got a pretty good guardian angel i'm grateful he's still still up at this game hexus mclaren had a weekend to forget last time out at slovakia ring after performing so strongly in June, in August, they couldn't seem to find the pace that they'd had earlier in the year. But the Moscow Raceway should suit the MP412C a little better, and Alvaro Parent is confident that the French team can get back on track. We're looking forward to getting to know the track and having a strong result, as last time uh, in Slovakia we didn't have such a strong weekend. Everyone's motivated and uh, trying harder and working harder to, to have a good race here in Russia. Last time out in the Slovakia ring, Marcus Winkelhock put in a brilliant last-ditch manoeuvre to take second place in the championship race on the final lap. The strength of the SLS AMG is in the fast corners, and although there aren't many of them here at the Moscow Raceway, Marcus Winkelhock is still looking forward to a strong weekend. I think we will struggle a little bit, but we try to set the car as good as possible uh, for the slow corners, and uh, now in the free practice I have to say the car was getting better and better. Um, especially at the end with new tyres, it was actually okay. Um, if you can improve a little bit for the qualifying, uh, I think we are in good, good pace and then for the race we will see. But I think it's not going to be easy this weekend for sure. Good morning everybody and welcome to the Moscow Raceway for the first ever visit of an FIA World Championship to Russia and it's the FIA GT1 World Championship that comes here and we've got the qualifying race coming up for you today the race that will decide the grid for the championship race which is also coming up today a little bit later on my name is Jack Nichols I'm up here in the commentary box in that main grandstand on your left hand side and alongside me here for the first time in Russia is John Watson John 8.6 degrees the track temperature, 7.6 degrees the air temperature. Not what we were promised, was it? No, but that is warmer than it was about three hours ago when we got to the racetrack just after dawn. But what a great circuit, 15 corners just under four kilometers. Really depends on the length of your stride. Some are saying just over four, saying are saying just under four. Anyway, super circuit, 15 corners, brand new, Herman Tilke design, not just the circuit, but all the infrastructure, the facilities, brilliant place to come for a, an FIA World Championship round. The first round in here in Moscow, Moscow Raceway, but more importantly, this is the first permanent motor race track in Russia. Can you imagine that? I know, it's amazing when you think of it in that way, but that is exactly what it is. There you can see the cars down there on the grid, and th th we have had a little spattering of rain, but I think most of the cars are going to be Okay, the McLarens are on wets, we're just being hearing. Looking out of the window, uh, it looked as though some of the cars were on slicks further back down the grid, but apparently the McLarens are going to be on wet weather tyres. I think we'll be able to tell soon enough who is on which particular tyre when the race actually gets underway. You can see that GT1 and GT3 have amalgamated grids this weekend, so the GT1 grid is the first half of the pack, and the second half of the pack is going to be the FIA GT3 European Championship grid, so we've got battles to be settled there as well. But up at the front, it was the Hexis lockout on the front row yesterday. Yeah, very much so. They dominated the qualifying when it mattered, and they've got that lockout. Five teams and all the teams have the majority, if not the entire field, are on the wet weather well, because the racetrack is wet. It certainly hasn't got anything like the standing water where it would 
Heggett obligatory to run a wet weather tyre, but it's because of the very low ambient and track temperatures, it means that if even there is a hint of a drying line, it will take time to appear simply because it's so cold. Yeah, that's very true. And so there's not actually very much wind. There's a little bit of wind coming from, well, whatever direction, because I haven't got a clue where we are in relation <laughs> to, to Moscow or anywhere else around us. Certainly there's a small wind blowing, but uh, track conditions are going to be tricky to start with. Well, here you can see the grid for McLaren Lockout, as we spoke about. Third place is going to be Ferrari. Fourth place behind him is going to be the Belgian Audi Club, uh, Audi R8 of Laurence Van Thor. And then big news for the BMWs they you may remember finished first and third in the championship race two weeks ago in Slovakia but Yama Berman and Michael Bartels will start at the back of the GT1 grid because yesterday they had an engine failure in the first segment of qualifying so they ended up being forced to start right at the back of the GT1 grid so you can see the two BMWs there and then that's where the GT3 grid will start we're not expecting them to mix up with each other too much because the GT3s have to have a longer time in the pit stops as is part of their regulations. So they may, the lower reaches of the GT1 grid may have flirtations with the front end of GT3, but we're not expecting that to be too much of a problem because they come up the hill towards turn nine, quite a difficult part of the circuit, and then they head down towards the main grandstand area once more. But you can see there's there's definitely some moisture out there on the circuit. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that there's not much prospect of GT3 cars challenging the GT1 cars, but in these conditions, it's up for grabs because everybody will be struggling for a grip, and some cars, and ironically, it may be some of the, the, the leading GT3 cars, may be slightly more competitive in these conditions than the GT1 cars at the tail of the field, discarding the two BMWs who are completely out of position, and that was down to issues, mechanical issues, there was an oil leak on the, the Berman Michael Bartels car. In fact, it was reminiscent of the Tory Canyon back in the 60s when it beached itself on the rocks off Devon or Cornwall. So, one line, one final uh, I to dot and uh, T to cross is that in the number 10 Ford GT, you may be used to seeing Milos Pavlovich and Matteo Crisoni in that car. This weekend, it's Aman Ibrahim and Benjamin Larish and the car will be started by Benjamin Larish. We're going to have two formation laps because of the damp conditions. No wet running so far here in Slovak uh, in uh, Russia, and you can see some of the fans up in the grandstand have got their brollies up. And there's no actual rain falling right now by the looks of no, things. The other, the other sort of uh, unusual sight, I mean, certainly saw it in Moscow on the first night we were there, is that when people are eating outside, a Stefano Telly just limbers up and gets his muscles free after having a couple of hours of downtime from the morning warm-up. But they all carry wool, heavy wool blankets, and they just wrap themselves up with it, and they seem to be as happy as you know what. Absolutely. So let's have a little look at the championship then. Michael Bartels and Yelma Berman are currently leading the championship. They are in the number 18 Beat for One Racing Team BMW. The second BMW you can see there, the uh, black and turquoisey blue coloured machine. They're leading the championship. Marcus Winkelhock and Mark Basseng in the Alinkle Mercedes there with the red trim on the front and the mirrors. They are second place in the championship, 16 points behind. And then in third place in the championship, we have our second place men, which is Steph Dusseldorp and Fred Makovicki. So Gregoire de Moustier will start that first McLaren. That man there is Steph Dusseldorp. He's going to be starting the second McLaren. He says there's his team boss, Philippe Dumas. Now what we've got to watch out for is the Ferraris. They tend to get their tyres up to temperature a little bit better, but we've seen so far this season these mixed conditions. They don't like them at all. Well, they've had... You know, these uh, mixed conditions, I think Nagaro was the last time I remember where the Ferrari looked very strong in the dry and it just disappeared when the damp conditions appeared. It's older as well, it happened, yeah. The, the issue with the Ferrari is that it fundamentally does warm its tyres quicker than the McLaren. Had this been a dry start, albeit in very cool conditions, I would have imagined that the Ferrari would have tried to split the two McLarens, and particularly in the case of Gregoire de Moussier, who's in that car which was put onto the pool position by teammate Alvaro Parent, he must be sitting there thinking, oh my God, why am I in this car at the start of the qualifying race? He, I don't believe, has ever taken the start, certainly never from pool position, and your first pool position, regardless of whatever category of motorsport you're involved in, adds an additional pressure, and alongside Steph Dusseldorp, 
who I don't think is going to be too much of a headbanger or a car banger going into turn one. But the Ferrari behind Tony Valander, he will look for every opportunity possible to stick the Ferrari between the two McLarens and try and steal the lead. It is Philippe Salacuada who will be starting the number three AF course of Ferrari with Tony Valander then taking over. There you can see Yelma Berman on the right, Nicky Mermanoff on the left. They're in the BMWs. And they are, you may have seen Nicky Mermanoff in the pre show film around Moscow. Uh, yes, Alvaro Parent, this was the first time Alvaro Parent did the third qualifying segment. So as a result, it's their first pole position of the season. And you're right, the first time Gregoire de Moustier has started the qualifying race, he tends to start the championship race. But they've switched it around for this weekend, so a lot of pressure on Gregoire's yeah. shoulders. And he's one of these, one of the few drivers you will actually see who races. Certainly he wears glasses out of the car. I suspect he wears them under the helmet. And uh, again, just the pressure and you start to breathe. You start breathing through your mouth when you're stressed. And of course, all the exhalation can then, inside the helmet, create condensation. And of course, then your glasses start to steam up. Absolutely. So how do you get your hand under the visor and you know, get <laughs> yeah. the oily rag out? Well, not the oily rag, the dry flint rag or flint, and get those glasses, make sure they stay clean. Yeah, no, it must be a, a difficult task. And you just saw a glimpse of the 102 car, which is Max Nielsen and Mika Bahamaki. You can tell the difference between the GT1 and GT3 cars uh, are twofold. Firstly, on the side of the cars, the and on the bonnet in some cases, the numbers are uh, the different way around. So there you can see the GT1 car, white background, black number. On the GT3 cars, it's a black background and a white number. Equally, the GT3 cars also have uh, one before each of their numbers, so they're all in the hundreds. For example, it's a 111 for the Rhino's Life at Motorsport Car of Harry Project and David Mengsdorf, as opposed to 11, which they usually run out. So as you saw, we've had a second lap behind the course car, but it looked to me as though the lights were off on the course car, and we'll go for a start this time around. That certainly looks to be the case. He's pulled to the inside line in that Mercedes-Benz. So we're going to have a two-by-two two rolling start here in GT1. It's the seventh round of the championship, and it's the first ever round of an FIA World Championship to be held in Russia, one of the largest and most important countries in the world. So Gregoire de Moustier then Technically, this car, this race started behind the safety car, you see, so it won't actually be two by two, but it will nevertheless be a rolling start. The green flag goes then, and away we go for the start of the qualifying race here in Moscow. Philippe Salaguada looking racy to start with. He goes up the inside of Dusseldorf into turn one, but he's outbraked himself, but so was the race leader, and who's going to lead then? Dusseldorf takes the lead. Second place is going to be the 33 Audi trying to force his way through. Oliver Jarvis, he manages to get into third position, into second position I should say so great start from him but two of our front three out breaking themselves at the first corner well first corner under pressure the Ferrari split the two McLarens but he just over the corner and again you saw one of the Audis behind that also getting into trouble again Ferrari being forced wide down the far end of the circuit down coming into turns eight and nine Oliver Jarvis is fancying this one isn't he he's got a great run out through eight and now up towards the uphill braking zone of turn nine a little tiny look towards the inside line but he's not close enough to make a move it's side by side here Gregoire de Moustier losing out to uh, Marc Bassang who's starting the 38 car then in come the GT3 cars further back and there's a spin that's de Moustier he's been collected by Philippe Salacuada the Ferrari and the McLaren come together down there at the left hander at turn 12. You have to say was it wise to swap around the way the drivers and that de Moustier parent car Hindsight's such a great thing that they didn't anticipate it being a wet race. Two McLarens on the front row of the grid. They've now got uh, stupid, <laughs> the second of the two McLarens of Steph Dusseldorf in third place. And it's Audi 1-2. Who would have thought that before we get up to the completion of one lap? Absolutely. It was actually turn 10 where those two came together. My apologies. And but more yes. body work coming off there. It's a bit of carbon fibre. You see it being flicked up in the air. Here's a look at the replay then. And... Uh, so he got tagged at the back. Yeah. I mean, the Ferrari just clipped the back of the car. Salacuada hit the back of De Moussier, and around he went. So De Moussier not to blame for that incident. So damp conditions and an Audi 1-2. It's like we're back in April, back at Nagaro. Things have come full circle. Audi have been poor, really, after the second round in Zolder. But now they're getting their act together. So leading the race, then, is the car of Lawrence Oliver Jarvis.
Davis with Lawrence Van Thor behind in the 32 machine. So that's how things are lining up at the moment. As we come down into this tight middle sequence of corners, you can see that the 37 car, which has been started by Nicky Pastorelli, has lost its Mercedes three-point star on the front. But now I think the Steph Dusseldorf McLaren is going to be coming under pressure from that car of Pastorelli. Pastorelli looking up the inside into turn nine, but he's not quite close enough as they come in with the left hander. There you can see, actually... That's what I anticipated happening, yeah. one of the GT3 cars. That's the Mercedes-Benz getting ahead of the second of the two. Uh, So down to the final corner they come, and one of the, the other Ferrari is starting to get involved as well. That is Francesco Castellaggi, but there's the look up the inside from Pastorelli. Is he going to make it through? There does tend to be more grip on the outside in the wet conditions, and that's demonstrated by Dusseldorf. So close to touching as they come over the line. This is the battle over fourth place into turn one. Not close enough again this time. There's Philippe Dumas. He's going to be concerned with how things have turned out for McLaren. A front row lockout has absolutely turned to uh, turned to a, a puddle, really. Well, I mean, there was in the in sort of these conditions, it was always going to be a very difficult start. The two McLarens, we know that they take a little longer to generate the heat in the tire, be it wet or dry tires, and uh, the Ferrari took that opportunity. But ultimately, it's been the two Audis of Jarvis and Van Thor who have taken the lead and are pulling away. Now we know that Audis probably come into their own probably about 11 or 12 hours into a 24-hour race. Here they've done it on the opening lap. Absolutely, so here's the, the look at the replay. Dusseldorf was pretty brave, actually, to come across on the exit of the corner to then shut off the... Uh, no, much choice. Look at that, fantastically close between the pair of them. So there's Marc Basseng running in third position behind the two Audis in front of him. In that first sector, Basseng was the quickest of those three, but only by a tenth of a second. So, not particularly notable. After that attack from Pastorelli, he's now going to be coming under pressure from Castellacci. And he's brought the 17 car of Matthias Lauda with him. So, Lauda's found some grip in these damp conditions, where his teammate and team boss, Michael Bartels, hasn't. You can see Bartels is right down the back of that field. Well, that car's never really looked like it's been working properly this morning. They, they did a the warm-up session but had to come in and out of the pitch just to make adjustments and again looking further back you can see behind Marco Bartels being challenged by the leading GT3 car that's the, the Mercedes SLS of uh, Barman and um, and Maximilian Book in the car at the minute so through the first corner they come once more to start the seventh lap of this race remember the first couple were behind the safety car Mark Bassang set the fastest second and third sectors of anyone on that last lap. So that Mercedes in third place is the quickest car out there on the circuit. A 1 minute 47.8. Half a second quicker than the race leading Audi of Oliver Jarvis. So Mark Bassang there starting to get the hammer down and starting to close in on those cars in front of him. Oh, look at the sparks flying out as he comes through turn six. Well, Brilliant stuff. I mean, they've softened off the rear of these SLS Mercedes-Benz, and that's the reason why we're seeing the sparks, just trying to get mechanical bite into the car. This is a brand new circuit, it's a very green circuit, and on top of which now with the rain, so you want to get as much of mechanical advantage performance from the car. The aerodynamics are probably of a secondary importance in these circumstances just right now. So through the right-hander at turn 10, then into this sequence of corners out through 11, 12, 13 and 14 that all kind of double back on themselves. And we're starting to get a real cue now behind Steph Dusseldorf. There is Mark Basseng. How's this sector? Well, Oliver Jarvis has gone purple in sectors one and two. So he's starting to get... Well, then Van Thor goes purple in sector, sector two. two. So it's not all over. And Van Thor, look, he's already aware that Basseng is offering up an opportunity that you can get down the inside, but we saw one lap ago, 
with this car, uh, with, the, with the sister car to that one, that it isn't actually that easy. Oh, and there, that, we wondered where that car had gone. Yeah, that's Max Nielsen who's gone off. And, and that, that may be a yellow flag, race, depending possibly, where the car is, yeah, because possibly he, the car is beached, he's getting out of it, he can't do anything about it. And uh, depending on where the car is in relation to the, the circuit, that might see a yellow flag in that. Well, they were going to see it coming in backwards, I suspect. Oh, was he got it a help? tap. Yes, it was. He got a tap from the Esther Motorsports car of Alexander Skirabin, I think. But he's far enough off the racetrack that um, there will be a recovery vehicle. We'll remove it. It may be a localised yellow. We wait yeah. and see. That was down at turn 10. So that's a real shame for Max Nilsson. But up at the front in the GT1 battle, Mark Bassenk's pace has just dropped off a tiny bit. The gap between he and Lawrence Van Thor in front was seven tenths of a second as they crossed the line. Looking out the window, I don't think we have more rain coming down, although the windscreen wipers are on, well, only on Pastorelli's car, really, so it can't be coming down too heavily as they crest the hill at turn nine. And we just saw the leading GT3 car go through. That is, as we expected it to be, the 101 car of Dominic Bauman. Performing pretty strongly in these wet conditions, which is allowing him well, to he, kind of catch up with the rest of the pack. Once the pit stops happen, though, that'll change. But yeah. I mean, right now, Bauman and the Mercedes, the silver and blue Mercedes at the tail of this five car chain, is effectively just being stalled out at the pace. Up, look up the inside. Can he get ahead of that first number one McLaren? Bump, Ooh, bump, bump contact on the edge between of the, the pair of them. That was rude stuff from Pastorelli. Didn't give Dusseldorf any room at all. They're still trading paint as they come down the back straight. It's a long old back straight, almost a kilometre long. Look how close they are as they come into the braking zone for 15. The McLaren should be able to hold on to this. Pastorelli's going to try and use the outside grip, the, but the he's Ferrari unable to do it. Pastorelli will get the cut back. Castellacci's getting involved as well as they come across the line. But uh, Pastorelli wasn't going to give him any room on the exit of 14, was he? No, and again, it was the cutoff coming into turn oh. 14. Damage to the bonnet of the Mercedes. And that's going to allow Castellacci to get into position. In fact, he's taken that position away. Just a bad exit out of turn one into turn two. And that's cast a position to the second of the Mercedes. Yep, the Mercedes outbroke himself, I think, going into turn one. Nicky Pastorelli and the slide coming on as they come through the right-hander. And he's now got the GT3 Mercedes right up behind him. So these wet conditions really... Leveling the playing field, Pastorelli, really this isn't his true pace because he's quicker than the McLaren in front. We've seen him trying to get past, but he's just losing all this time in the traffic. Here's a look at the replay. He gets up the inside here and then really, you know, doesn't give Dusseldorf any room on the exit. Well, both cars are sliding a fair amount and uh, it's, I mean, I, I don't have a particular problem with that situation. I've seen much, much worse. But it's Castellacci in the Ferrari who's getting under the rear wing of the McLaren. And uh, we saw he got past the Mercedes-Benz, and uh, that was a very simple pass. So into the left-hander at 11 they come. 12, sorry, then into 13. It's a new circuit for everyone. They've had World Series by Renault here, and they had some bikes here last weekend. World Superbikes, World Superbikes. Superbikes. And, uh, oh, and that's a spin for Benjamin Larish. And again, this is Ferrari. It looks, that's the second time that car, that Esther Ferrari, has tagged another car. And again, one of the Russian motorsport cars the, on the right-hand side of the track having to take avoiding action. Yep, so that was... Uh, I think that might have been the other Esther Ferrari, actually, the 199 car driven by Alexei Basov that made the contact there. But into the final corner they come. And this is Nicky Pastorelli squabbling with the Ferrari in front. Ultimately, over fifth place is uh, that Ferrari. So fifth is the Ferrari, sixth is Nicky Pastorelli, and he's got the he, Heiko Mercedes right up behind him. And he's got pressure from that Mercedes because you can see on different parts of the track that uh, Pastorelli is having to wait all the time before he can get on the par, and Maximilian Booker's pushing to try and open the position, make the position that the GT3 Mercedes can get ahead of the... GT1 Mercedes. Now, Lawrence, have to whisper that, by the way. Lawrence Van Thor is closing in on Oliver Jarvis now. Van Thor, the quickest man on the circuit on that last lap, he took four tenths of a second out of Oliver Jarvis's lead. More they... rain, actually. You can see in that uh, camera down there, looks like more rain at the far end of the circuit. Yep, and it looks like they've also decided to leave Max Nielsen's car where it is, deciding it's not in too dangerous a position. Fairly low speed corner there. And there you can see the Audi WRT team. Once again, watching their cars do battle at the front, but as I say, we haven't seen this since Nagara at the opening round. It's great to see, really, because I think a lot of us expected 
Audi to be real strong title contenders. Well, I, I always look at the Audi R8 as being you know, brilliant 24-hour race cars because they're just bulletproof. They're not necessarily ultimately the most competitive ones one hour sprint race car but we saw in Navarro and Nagaro that they were very very effective and again likewise in Anzalder but with the advent of the McLaren and its evolution and other cars the BMW Z4 M4Z it's, it's been under pressure look at the front of the Demusier car the right front bits of bodywork again the bodywork on the front of Pastorelli's Mercedes that was contact we saw much earlier in the, in the race he tries to sell the dummy to Castellacci, gets the outside line and then will try and drive through the corner with get more speed out and then have a look up the inside into one. That's exactly what he's going to try and do. Castellacci's not going to give him much room, but there's just enough room for an SLS. They're going to go wide and he's going to take both of them. So through goes Dominic Bauman to take both of the cars in front of him after some good battling between the pair. But ultimately, it's Bauman who comes off on top. Well, that's what, when you're racing and you're watching your competitors racing into a corner, both of them were so tight on the inside of the corner, it was just a no-brainer that Man's Chameleon Book was just going to place that GT3 Mercedes-Benz into the position that the Ferrari and the GT1 Mercedes were holding. So, that means as the sparks fly up, ultimately, it doesn't make any difference because these guys are effectively running in different classes. Here we go, looking at it again. Yeah, but look where the Mercedes, that's currently third of these three cars, way out to the left, the other two right on the inside. They lose five to ten miles an hour on the exit in terms of acceleration and speed, and uh, such an easy pass. Let your opponents give you the opposite, the position, rather than you having to work for it. Yeah, absolutely. So, now we're going to see... Well, we're starting to see Matthias Lauda pick up some pace as well. He's joined the fight. He's now challenging Francesco Castellacci. We're going to see the two Mercedes now disappear on up the road. I imagine we will. They'll close in with Steph Dusseldorf again before too long. Purple first sector for Vanthor, then a purple second sector for Jarvis. The two Audis battling hard. We've got double wave yellows yes. up there. That must be at That's turn 10. Perhaps that must they're be still for the Mercedes, yeah, the Mercedes no doubt. They're recovering that Mercedes up there. So down into the final corner. There you can see the Mercedes being removed. And uh, we've got 37 minutes of this race remaining. So all of a sudden, in about two minutes' time, the pit stop windows will be opened, which is something that we I hadn't even considered because we've had so much action kicking off so far. Well, the, the question that people will have to answer is, do we stick with the wet weather tyre, the deep treaded wet weather tyre in conditions which are at almost the crossover point but there isn't any sense of a drying line but as long as the rain stays away it doesn't it doesn't fall in so you know you could yeah i mean we've seen in the past that this team Audi, they made that error i think in zolder there still looks to me like there's a little bit of rain falling at the far end of the track but overall it's not deteriorating but do they take a punt or whatever the russian equivalent is of a punt a ruble and uh, <laughs> go on to the dry weather tire or do they say we'll put dry weather slicks on one of our two cars and keep wet weather tires on the other for me that would be the right way to go but you know that one of them is going to be a loser and that driver will not want to be the loser you can see that they've, they've started to pull away from the munich motorsports alinkel car of mark basseng and, and look at van thor flashing his lights at oliver jarvis telling him that I'm quicker than you, I want to come through. There's no spray, though. That's the, uh, that, that's the one thing. There's very little to no spray at all coming off these cars, so it can't be that wet out there. I think it's going to be greasy. I tell you what, Jack, it's a lot drier on the commentary booth. It's, yeah, it certainly is. That's, uh, that's for sure. Having to go defensive now is Dominic Bauman from Nicky Pastorelli behind him as they come down into the final corner. Little tentative look up the inside from Matthias Lauder on Francesco Castellacci, but he decides against it. Still, Berman and uh, Bartels, Bartels at the wheel, really struggling. Where are they now? They're down in 11th position, aren't they? So it's uh, very, very tight. The race leaders, though, are very much together. Well, Lawrence Van Thor clearly, as we saw flashing his lights at Oliver Jarvis, as they came down the long straight and Van Thor closing almost by the corner onto the lead car driven by Oliver Jarvis. Frank Stippler getting ready to get into that car and Oliver Jarvis hands it over to him and uh, it'll be very soon that the pit stop window will be open 
and uh, will Oliver Jarvis be the first of these tidies? It's open, in fact, as we speak. Looking down from the commentary position, we can now see that the, the barrier and the passport control has now been waived, and people <laughs> can come into the pit lane. So, as long as they got their visas into the double left at the far end of the circuit. I was going to say, that'll do nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Turn 11 and 12. And Oliver Jarvis really starting to struggle now. Lawrence Van Thor all over the back of him. We saw Frank Stibler getting ready, but he certainly didn't look ready enough to take over. So down the back straight they come. Are either of these two cars going to come into the pits as soon as possible and take a bit of a gamble? Van Thor noses towards the inside, but both of them stay out at the moment. Van Thor, in fact, oh, I thought he was going to send one down the inside. We've seen the two Audis. They're very evenly matched cars. We've seen them battling so often. And, well, this is uh, the V4 racing team. They had slicks ready, but they've just, as we just saw, changed their mind and are going to put wet tyres on the car. Well, when... they may just put it on, again, this thing of the Ferrari coming in. And the question is, if you've got two cars, do you put them both out on the same tyre or do you take the risk and go for slicks on one of those two team cars? And uh, it looked like BMW on one of their two cars. That might have been the Berman yep, Bartels car is. because we saw Berman running across from the pit, from the garage to the pit wall. But it's a it's a, a big risk to take. You've got a 10-minute window. You don't have to make your decision until the last possible moment. And I suspect that's what Audi's going to do with the BMW in the pits. So in the pits comes Michael Bartels. And why make out exactly what the tyres are that are going on. It looks like slicks, but it's very difficult to tell yeah, from that camera slicks. angle. That, I'm pretty sure that right was uh, a slick. Yeah, those are slick tyres going on for Michael, uh, well, for Yama Berman. So that's going to be very interesting. Well, we have in the pit lane here, chaps. The Ferrari and the BMW going absolutely side by side. And the Ferrari in the end then, just getting out in front of the V to one racing car. As they exit the pit lane, so everyone now will be glued to Yama Berman's sector tyres. I, I think maybe the Ferrari have done the same thing you could see under acceleration. The Ferrari was squirming at the rear. And look how look, tippy towing both Ferrari and the BMW really struggling. Let's look again. You've got to be very careful when you release the car. Once that Ferrari was moving before the BMW, you had to give way, let the Ferrari take the position in the pit lane. Into the final corner come our race leaders then. Oliver Jarvis leading in the 33 Audi. Second place is the 32 Audi of Lawrence Van Thor. He flashes the lights as he looks to the inside. Have we got any of these chaps coming into the pit lane? No, we haven't. So they are staying out for the time being. Ortelli heads out to the back of the garage for a brief moment. Then we've got the 17 car of Matthias Lauda. He then is running in eighth position but that is ultimately seventh position because uh, well it's now ultimately sixth position now he's got past the ferrari because we've still got one of the gt3 cars in that battle as well but look how close these two are van thor trying to find a way through turn two now they start to drop down the hill through the flat out right hander audi going wet now we saw them have all sorts of trouble in zolder when it came to tire choices i think they ended up it was a miscommunication, wasn't it? They couldn't get the message to from their drivers to the teams about which tyres they wanted. I mean, now just looking on the camera shot there, there's still a lot of rain on the camera lens. Whether it is physically raining or not, it's hard to tell. But I think that Audi have felt they've talked to both their drivers. They have to trust the opinion of both their drivers. As we see the BMW and the Ferrari, we believe both, certainly the BMW, the BMW slicks, and they're really pussyfooting it around. And right now, you have to say, at just about half distance in this race, that that's the wrong call at the time. The wipers and the BMW certainly are going because there is a certain amount of rain falling. And there's a little bit of spray coming from the back of the Ferrari as well. Well, that shot showed us that we're going to get an absolutely perfect demonstration of which car, which tyre it's best to be on, because here come the Audis, and they're coming up to the slick shot BMW. So next time we go to the start of the start finish straight, we'll see the BMWs and Ferraris coming down on their slicks, and then the Audis behind on their wet weather tyres. So that middle sector for Michael Bartels was a one minute four, which is some 15 seconds off the pace. The final sector, though, was decent. Only six seconds off the pace in that final sector for the slick cars. But look at them, they're struggling so much. Yeah, but you're talking about a technical sector where there's a lot of pre yeah. premium put on. The grip simply, Yalma uh, Berman gets up the inside. 
and uh, makes a position, but the Ferrari tries to make the cut back, gets alongside on the oh, edge of the corner. This is going to get a bit dodgy the for the leaders. race lead. Look, here comes Ortelli. He's going to send it up the inside, and is he about to take the lead of the race? He is. Fantastic move, but Jarvis is holding on around the outside. They went either side of the back markers there. Brilliant stuff, but Oliver Jarvis has managed to hold on to the lead. What a nervy moment that must have been for the Donald Audi Van team. Four, super read the situation perfectly, got his car ahead of the other Audi to take the lead when they were lapping back markers who are on slicks. And this one by Clarence doing. Can't That's quite see. Is that look like a wet tire? Look like a wet to me going on the number one car of uh, Fred McAvicky now. But what a brilliant piece of action that was. Well, opportunism again. That's what drivers have to do. They have to read situations. The two cars, the BMW and the Ferrari, on slicks, pushy footing their way around. These two cars arrived at them, almost overran them. Oliver Jarvis was forced to go out to the right. And, of course, that was the door open then for Lawrence Van Four, who has been flashing his lights on Oliver Jarvis to say, I feel I'm quicker than you. Now Oliver Jarvis is returning the, the present and look again very close. Here we see it again. Oliver Jarvis on the left of picture gets squeezed by the Ferrari and... Uh, so easy peasy for Lawrence Van Four up the inside. Jarvis hung it on though well, didn't he, around the outside to then have the inside line for the next corner and hold on to the lead. Right, we've got Van Thor in the pits. Second place man, Lawrence Van Thor, is coming down into the pits. And we will see the 32 car change its tyres. That also gave you a perfect demonstration of the fact that wet tyres are the tyres to be on because we saw the wet and soft cars just drive around the outside of the slick cars. So have a little look for this left hand side that is new oh, what's going yeah. on and into the pits also comes Mark Basseng that's going to be wet on that car as well before he hands over to Marcus Winkelhock so out of the pits comes Van Thor good job from him 27 minutes remaining or well, 28 really in this race oh is that a bit of a slow left <laughs> You got a clear yeah, it's a these. very slow left rear, and the Audi team were not happy at all with that as they come out of the pits. And, well, let's see. Al Inkle didn't have a particularly quick stop because there was definitely a problem with the 32, but the 38 car wasn't particularly fast either. So this could play into the hands of Oliver Jarvis when he comes in and hands over to Frank Stippler. They could find themselves with a comfortable advantage, but we'll have to wait and see. But at the moment now, Stefano Telli has to go out and find the grip for himself. Yes, and of course, like most drivers, have never driven this racetrack, Moscow Raceway, on wet weather tyres. You can see Otelli having to let the car... And then, look, a problem. Is it a problem for the lead car? Coming very slowly down into the pit lane. I think it's just I think it's just actually the, 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 image, the wide the shot. Line, yeah, because I mean, it's it such looks, a long straight. It's so, it so slow on a zoom. Coming down there, but they're probably still doing over 200 kilometres well, an hour. 260 was what they were doing in the dry. Yeah. Into the pits then comes Oliver Jarvis. What are they going to choose to do? I presume they're just going to stick him out on wet. That can be the only real option when no one around you is taking the gamble. We saw BMW take that gamble. It didn't pay off for them at all because Bartels, uh, sorry, Berman was losing some 15 seconds in the pits. Now what? So they are wet. Yeah, I'm they sure are they are. I, mean, I can't imagine they're not going to put this car back. Oliver Jarvis had a great job for ID. Lost the lead momentarily, and uh, now hand over to Frank Stippler. So Frank will be, uh, again, I mean, everybody's going to go out. It's a mystery tour. They don't know what level of grip they've got. The opening lap is going to be very tough indeed. And the fear is that having committed to the wet weather tyre, which is the right choice at the point you make it, ultimately, will it be the right choice when this race concludes in just under 30 minutes? Now, out goes Frank Stippler, and I think he's going to comfortably hold the lead because of that slow pit stop. Stefano Telli is not going to be close enough to challenge him through the first corner. Uh, or out of the pit lane exit, I should say, comes Frank Stippler, and he comfortably leads from Stefan Otelli. But Otelli will have had a lap now to get to grips with the car, get to know how the car's performing in these damp conditions. McLaren in the pits as well, going for uh, wet weather tyres, as is everyone, really. It was only Berman and Bartels that took that slip gamble. Everyone else saw their lap times and went through. Yeah, no, no way are we going out on that. On slicks. Hexes complete that pit stop. Come on, Fred, get it in the gear. As Alvaro Perrin, that was, getting into the number two car. So let's see how things are progressing up at the front. Stippler, or Telly's closing in on Stippler. Stippler gets a little bit out of shape, and you can see how quickly the gap has closed down. So this is the battle for the lead. 
we saw in Nagaro, Stefano Telli, well, the 32 car taking the lead away from the 33 car. Are we about to see it again here at the Moscow Raceway? Well, they've, they've had the benefit of being out that one lap earlier. It's clear to see because the gap when they joined the circuit when Stipler came was probably three or three or so seconds. Now it is the well, the gap between the two cars is a car length, and the momentum clearly with Stefano Telli. The further the lap goes, the momentum will start to swing back to Frank Stipler, but Otelli looking to go the long way around, which frequently in these conditions is the quick way. He's got a good run off turn 14. He's going to get up alongside, but he's going to have to go the long way around if he's going to get past his teammate into turn 15. So down the hill they come, and on the outside line, then it's Stefano Otelli. He's got such a good drive out of there. He might be able to get it done before they get to the braking zone, and he has. So Stefano Otelli, a little twitch under braking, but he moves into the lead of this race second place then now is frank stippler maybe following his teammate he'll be able to get to grips with the car a little bit more well i mean you can see clearly that stippler backed off that little bit earlier than stefan otelli he's you know he's completed his first lap now he'll get a better sense of where the car is and the performance he's got but uh, stefan otelli has had the additional lap on the wet weather tire he's got that confidence and he knows that he can push and this is the moment he needs to make that push to draw away from his teammate who will no doubt at the end of this lap find himself running at a similar time to Otelli. So you can see Otelli though has pulled away pretty quickly. He's got some GT3 cars to lap. There's Lawrence Van Thor in the woolly hat to the right of shot. And uh, well, it's not GT3 cars to lap actually. It's the number three car of Enzo Eid. They come very, very close to one another. Uh, sorry, Tony Valanda. And both Audis have got around, but Otelli lost out big time in trying to get past Valanda. And that has allowed Stipler right back onto his case again. There's Oliver Jarvis. Happy to see himself on telly. Yeah, absolutely. And delighted to be in a winning or certainly in a leading or a podium position. That's been a difficult period when the Audis weren't on the podium. And uh, now he sees taking the opportunity with mixed weather. There is the hint you can see just coming at the bottom end of the circuit of a drying ish line. Certainly, it's the width of one wheel, not the full width of uh, the car. But we've got what remaining in terms of what 25 minutes or so can't see it changing sufficiently but what is for sure the battle just coming onto the back straight the mercedes and the ferrari what is for sure is that if you're not looking after your wet weather tires at the end of the race suddenly you will find yourself losing a lot of time into the braking zone they come the mercedes uh, isn't a battle i think that's just mark by saying lapping tony Belanda, who's struggling so much i wonder if they put Belanda out on slick tires or it's just the Ferrari struggling in these damp conditions as we saw. So our first, second and third cars are now running in fifth, ninth and even further down in the case of that Ferrari, 19th place for Tony Valanda. So it has not gone well for them at all. But now we've seen Frank Stippler, that, that little back marker incident has played into his hands because he's negated that time that he was going to lose getting up to speed yeah i mean sometimes you need a little bit of good fortune on your side and that was the good fortune that has helped frank stippler remain in contact with uh stefan otelli who is leading this race and uh, it's going to be a battle i don't real i don't believe they will race one another they will say whoever is leading after the pit stops probably that's the position we'll we will keep and not see our two drivers fight each other with the danger particularly in difficult conditions as these are uh, and take each other or one of the cars out potentially well Stippler is looking Stippler's the better Stippler's of the two at this point I mean this is again the far end of the racetrack coming down through 12 13 and then ultimately on to the back straight they've got the Ferrari the GT3 Ferrari to get around we've seen how some of the slower cars the GT3 cars have come into play in terms of whereabouts you catch them on the circuit and how much opportunity that will offer up one of the two lead cars. Stippler's looking quicker now. He took three tenths of a second out of Ortelli that time around. So now they're going to try and lap the 199 Ferrari, which is now in the hands of Bjorn Grossman, down into the final corner. You can see Ortelli just showing his nose up the inside to say, hello, I'm here. I'm going to be lapping you in a moment. You better get ready to move out of the way. So Grossman comes across the line. And then followed by the two Audi. Stippler is looking the quicker of the two. Did he gain any more time in that final sector? No, they were pretty much line of stern through there. But this is going to be an interesting battle. Audi aren't involved in any championship battles particularly. They're not in the hunt for the drivers' or team's championship. So 
they've got nothing to lose by their yeah, but, two but, but, cars. But what they have got to lose is they don't want one or both cars taking the of other course, ride. Of course. Going we've back to Frank Stippler, yeah, we've seen what we've seen was what I know about Frank Stippler is in these conditions, I think he's going to be very effective. Do you know why? Because he races historic cars on real old race tyres, which are probably much less grip than they got with the wet weather tyre here. But he's accustomed, that's what I'm trying to get to, to having a car with very little grip moving around. And therefore, he's probably fairly comfortable in these, these circumstances, more so than maybe Stefan Ortelli is, who's only accustomed to racing on your contemporary race cars with tons of grip from a slick tyre. That's very true. Stippler right up behind Stefano Telli now. Oh, he might be able to get a nose up the inside here. There's going to be contact if these two aren't careful. Not quite. Stippler has the inside line going into the left-hander at 13. Otelli holds it on around the outside and pulls it off. But then they're going to have the right-hander now. And Otelli will have the inside line. Side-by-side -side stuff between the two WRT Audis. They've been side-by-side -side for three corners now as they head down the back straight. Crucially, Stippler has the inside into the final corner. Otelli and pushes him towards the inside. Who's it going to be under the braking zone? Jarvis watching on. Surely Stippler will get the job done and take the lead of the race. Under braking into the final corner. And Frank Stippler moves into the lead. Round of applause from his teammate. This isn't over, though. Otelli's coming back at him down the start finish straight. Stippler pushes him towards the pit wall. Brilliant racing between the two teammates. And Otelli's back into the lead. Well, if I was Pierre Giordone, who runs this WRT RD team, I would be saying, tell those idiots it's great racing, but remember, we want to take maximum points. There are fewer points, obviously, in a qualifying race. There'll be 14 points in maximum for the team, eight for a win and six for a second. Nevertheless, they're points up for grabs, but more crucially, they want to lock out the front row of the grid for the, the championship race. That is the ultimate key for Audi right now. And while we're enjoying a battle of teammates, and it's been a great battle and a clean battle to boot, we have to also remember that it's all about positioning your cards for the money race, the championship race, the big points race. So you can see the two Audis leading, then the two Mercedes-Benz in third and fourth place in the hands of Marcus Vingelhock and Thomas Jaeger. Then we've got the number one McLaren in fifth place. It's uh, Fred Makovicki now at the wheel of that car ahead of the first of the Ferrari 458s driven by Enzo Ede. Enzo's doing pretty strongly in these conditions. Then the BMWs in seventh and ninth positions. It's not gone very well for them so far today. Well, so far this weekend, in fact. And then we've got the Ford GT after that contact in the early laps, running further down the field. There's the man that's... Uh, yep, the Pierre de Donne runs the team, and he's a very, very experienced race driver in his own right. He was actually a teammate of mine away back in, do you know when? Uh, and he's been a part of the ID team for many, many years. He understands how to win motor races with his team. And uh, now we're seeing the gap stabilizing Frank Stippler, having had that battle for the best part of two laps to get ahead of his teammate Stefan Ortelli, has now consolidated that. And maybe Ortelli has realized that today I'm not able to compete with Frank Stippler over the course of the 16 odd minutes remaining. So there. They've even got a blanket and a helicopter. <laughs> it's a great vantage point, no doubt. There you saw Grossman running wide and allowing. Marcus Winkelhock to come through. Thomas Jaeger's on it. He's just set the purple last sector of anyone in, so far in this session and personal best on that lap. So he did a 46.7, took a second out of the leaders. He is 14 seconds down the road, but nevertheless, it's a, a good lap time from Thomas Jaeger as he battles that hex to McLaren. After the GT3 pit stops, as we said, they have dropped out of contention. Now we're watching Alvaro Parent sweep past Yama Berman. Now, how many... I don't know if Yama has been... OK, Yama, has, that was a lapping. That was a bit of lappery we just saw. Yama out there, I think, still on slick tyres, because I don't think he's come back into the pits again. You can see him twitching. He's really, him. really struggling. I mean, there's, just, there's just no grip there, and uh, you make your choices, and you, you'll have to live with it. There's no point in coming back into the pits and uh, the time lasts. But you're looking at Alvaro Perent. I mean, I want to see Alvaro Perent really get on with the programme in this car. He put it on pole position. It was Gregoire de Bouzier who started the race, and I suspect that Gregoire de Bouzier was probably the most nervous driver in the whole of Russia because he knew that there was going to be huge pressure on him not to make an error, and of course, that's what happened. So there you can see the GT3 standings. Dominic Bauman and Maximilian Boot currently leading that 101 car. 
Then we've got the Lamborghini in second, driven by David Mengsdorf at the moment. Third place is the 150 car of Giuseppe Ciro. So they started down in ninth place uh, on the grid in GT3. But Ardagna Perez and Giuseppe Ciro are now running in third position. It's Bowen and Book battling Giuseppe Ciro and Gaetano Ardagna Perez for the win in GT3. There you can see the second place car, David Mengsdorf at the wheel at the moment. Him and Harry Prochik yet to not finish on the podium so far this season in GT3. Very impressive stuff. Back to the lead and Frank Stippler is dropping back a little bit now and I would suggest Marcus Winklock is closing in on him. So the pace between these front two has really fluctuated. They've, they've been going together and apart again like an accordion. We're about to see a replay uh, of a spin for one of the Russian Bear Motorsports and, cars. And that may have been a contribu contribution to the, the gap differing between the, the two Audis at that moment of the Ferrari getting off track, having to back on a bit momentarily. It was Kirill Ladigan going for a spin. There is the lead car, 32, Frank Stippler. It's Stefano Telli. Oh, yeah. Frank Stippler is 33 30, behind. Yeah. Yeah. You can see on that last lap, Stippler lost three tenths of a second. So, that's so a, that was that was the uh, the Ferrari we saw spinning. Yeah, so that's a reasonable chunk of time that they've lost out there. But this is good news for Audi, as I say, a one-two uh, in this order. In fact, in Nagaro, in both the championship and the qualifying races. But since then, they haven't been back on the podium. Of fifth place in Slovakia last time out is their best since that opening day victory. So they'll be very pleased if they can get back on the top step of the podium which it looks like with 13 minutes remaining they'll be able to do but let's not discount Marcus Winkelhock here he's gone purple uh, sorry green in the middle sector let's see what he does as he comes across the line he lapped four tenths of a second quicker than the 32 33 Audi on that last lap so the gap between them comes down to just 2.4 seconds there's Michael Bartels who I imagine isn't in a very good mood no, they're the best car they've got is in seventh place. That's the Nicky Mayo Eihoff and Matthias Lauder. And uh, disappointment for BMW. They came here linking the circuit. was going to be right up their street. They had a super result. Two races in uh, Slovakia and uh, a whole sack full of points for that. But uh, in qualifying, it just all went wrong. 18th place. It, it is moment. a drying line. There yeah. at the track, all of a sudden, the, the circuit has given up a drying line. Even the kerbs, cars are being confident enough to run the kerbs. Normally, they're the last thing on a racetrack to get dry. Yeah, we're getting faster and faster because Stefan Artelli has just set the fastest first sector of anyone of 39.994. And we're starting to see the McLaren of Fred Makovicki come back into the fray now. Him and Thomas Jaeger are battling fairly closely. They've only been six tenths of a second apart for the large majority of this race in the battle over fourth position. And uh, oh, big slide from Makovicki. Brilliant stuff as he keeps the McLaren in check. Not the quickest way to get around the left no, hand. For the tent. remainder of this race, the majority of the field run wet weather tyres. They've made that change in the mandatory pit stop. It's about babying your tyres and making sure that those tyres have got life when others have pushed maybe too hard. And consequently, in the uh, what, 8 to 12, 14 minutes of the race remaining, will struggle 11 minutes just over 11 and a half minutes to go so fred makovicki has clearly got the mercedes-benz in sight and he will want to use the benefit of being gentle on its tires to try and force the mercedes into a mistake across the line they come with 11 minutes to go the man with the stopwatch on the pit wall would have timed that lap at a 1 minute 46.787 for fred makovicki but thomas jaeger is he knows he knows McLaren is catching, he knows. Let me see a pass up the inside, that's the That's second. the battle between yes. Nicky Mayer Melnoff and Alvaro Parent. Alvaro Parent going past Mayer Melnoff and moving up into seventh position. And they've got the leading GT3 car right behind them. Dominic Buk is, at, uh, sorry, Maximilian Buk is at the wheel now. So that's all over seventh place. Alvaro Parent might even be able to catch up. Well, he definitely will be able to get up and try and attack Enzo Eid in front now in that AF Corsa Ferrari that you can see slithering out wide through turn three. A corner which just goes on and on and on and on and on. And then you take the apex very late indeed. But Enzo Eid is going to have to defend hard from Alvaro Parent in a minute. Because Parent, a very, very quick driver, very well liked down at Woking. 
and he's got so much more confidence through eight, he may well be able to make the move into nine. But here's a look at the replay. Straight forward into the final corner. It looks pretty much so. Not Well, in fact, he didn't quite get the nose of the McLaren sufficiently far off the inside to be confident of taking the corner. And uh, Elmer Berman you know, really, really had to give him a bit of extra room on the inside, but they got the job done when it counted. Yeah, it was Mayor Mountoff that he was battling, and there you can see that Perez has already got past, so he may well have got the move done at turn nine. He's passed Enzo E and now up into sixth position, so it's McLaren fifth and sixth after they started the race one and two not been a good day for them but let's not forget this particular McLaren was rotating uh, halfway around lap one wasn't it after Gregoire de Moustier got a bit of a tap from behind it's a bit of an aggressive move isn't it when going from sharp right to sharp left as if he's going to come into the pit lane though he goes back now you need to be careful doing that without any other cars around you I don't think it'll be a problem but if uh, where other cars close if you were using more than one deliberate move to block or move across the track then you'll be required as the Ferrari again goes defensive but primarily goes to the wetter part of the track the Ferrari tires probably beginning to say I've had enough and the Mercedes is the four the one of the cars of the four that really looks the strongest big moment for Mayor Manoff through turn one wasn't it and then allowed Maximilian Boot to almost get a look up going into the next corner at turn two but there you can see the gap now is up to 5.1 seconds and there's Eid running wide, getting out of shape. Not enough room for Mayor Melnoff. There's only half a second between second and third places, so that's going to be one to keep an eye on as well. But this is great battling over seventh position now. Enzo Eid, the Belgian driver in the number four Vita for One racing team, uh, AF Corsa car, being pressured by the Vita for One racing team BMW. But here's the battle over second place then. Stefano Telly's disappeared, he's gone on up the road, but Marcus Vingelhock is desperately trying to split the two Audis. Mark Basseng cheering him on, looks to the outside now on the run down the back straight, into turn 15. What can Vingelhock do on the brakes? He managed to make a move on the final lap around the outside at turn one in Slovakia. Can't quite get the cutback this time. Well, he's, he's going to be in good shape because he's going to dive down the inside. Stippler goes to defend, cuts back again to get the exit out of the corner. Stippler, very defensive. See the car sliding as it turned in. The Mercedes just had more bite, more grip, tries to get down the inside into turn two. Gets the job done. Yeah, great stuff. That was that was really clever, actually, from Winklehock. If we... Well, we worked it up in the commentary booth. He's not that bright. Yeah, no, I know, but he managed to, uh, he managed to force Frank Stippler to break on the wet part of the circuit, whereas Winklehock then after his little dummying around, ended up breaking on the dry part of the circuit. So Vingelok now moves up into second position, which again, it just sums up the Mercedes and Al Inkle's season that they might not have the brilliant pace, but the races happen and they just always end up near the well, front. The reason I think we've just seen what we've seen is simply because Winkelhock has looked after his tyres. He's got fundamentally just more bite and grip from the tyres on the Mercedes than Stifler has got in his idea. And uh, Stifler maybe has just been too aggressive, too hard on those tyres, consequently lost contact with his own teammate Ortelli, and now has lost second place to a competitor Mercedes-Benz. Good drive by Marcus Winkelhock. Through turn 13, Winkelhock now up into second place. He's seven seconds behind the race leader with six and a half minutes to go. I think even Marcus Winkelhock won't be able to close that in, especially with Stefan Ortelli being the man ahead. There you can see the race leader is the 32 Audi. That Russian Bears Ferrari is a backmarker in GT3. And we've also got the battle kicking off between the second Mercedes and McLaren. That's coming down the back straight now as well. So Vingelhock breaks, turns into six, uh, 15, and heads out onto the start, finish straight then to complete his 29th lap. And here's the battle then going on. Is Fred Makovicki attacking Thomas Jaeger? And he's got such good grip out of the corner, he's able to get to the outside line. And he's got such good momentum off the corner. He's able to make the move stick. Great stuff from Fred Makovicki. He moves up into fourth place. Yeah, McLaren again, light on his tyres, coming to the McLaren. The speed that they didn't have at the start of the race, they really struggled with a lack of grip. Now Fred Makovicki can push. But, of course, all the damage was done on the opening lap, and uh, he's down in fourth place. And, uh, well, he's 17 seconds behind the lead car, but he's uh, crucially eight seconds behind the third-place ID. There we saw Mark Brasseng, teammate of the second place car now. Him and Marcus Winkelhock will not move themselves into the lead of the championship, but they will close the gap down to just 10 points. 
with three rounds, including this one to go. Five minutes to go here at the Moscow Raceway and an entertaining debut World Championship event in Russia. Looks like it's going to see Stefano Telli take victory for WRT Audi, but with five minutes to go, anything can still happen, especially on a greasy, tricky, damp circuit. Down the back straight, you can see him hugging the inside line to try and keep as much moisture on those wet tyres as possible. If the race were to start now, I think everyone's going to be on slick. So this afternoon when we have the championship race, unless we get some more rain, all these cars are going to be on slick tyres and their pace will be different again. It's going to be a totally different race. And uh, I mean, assuming that the rain stays away, there's a reasonable wind blowing, so hopefully that'll keep the rain away. What well, fell wasn't particularly heavy, but it was enough to soak the track. And uh, it's taken the best part of 55 minutes to get the drying line. And everybody who made the pit stop, with the exception of one of the BMWs, opted to go back on the wets. That was the right choice. But the key was protecting those wet tyres for the second half of the race. And once the drying line began to appear, try not to load the tyre too much and wherever possible, run on the wetter part of the racetrack. So I wonder where Frank Stippler's pace gone. That's the interesting thing. Well, I, I right think he just maybe either abused the tyre or he's got an issue with the car we're not aware of. Because once uh, Otelli got past, he just has been the gap between first and third is 11 seconds. And I, don't, I can't see any obvious reason other than down to rubber. No. So there you can see Stippler, you can see the clear dry line as well. And he crests the hill. He's not going to come under danger, I don't think, from Fred Makovicki behind. Well, I mean, the gap right now, well, they're going to come across the start-finish line. The last time it was seven seconds. The last, the last lap... So it was five three seconds, seconds five out seconds. of Frank Stipper on yeah, that because he's got Yeah, because he's got more grip. Three I mean, this seconds. Is, yeah, but that happens. I had to, I've done <laughs> that in the dry in a Grand Prix. OK, well, well done. The video's available, the DVD's available. <laughs> but anyway, when you've got grip and Stippler is having to be so cautious on those tyres, as we're seeing Otelli coming down into turn one, there is the gap. You can see the gap between third and fourth has halved in the last lap. And I reckon Makovicki will probably take that third place away with two and a half minutes of this race to go. So down into the final corner they come. The wipers are on for Stippler, but there is no rain falling by the looks of things. Fred Makovicki, meanwhile, has got his McLaren MP412C absolutely hooked up. Across the line they come. The gap between them now as they come across the line is just 2.3 seconds. So Makovicki is going to be on the back of Stippler pretty much before the end of this lap. This will, I think, be the penultimate lap of the race. We'll have to wait and see when they come across the line. Look, but there look, you can look, see. 3.1, 2.9 and half a second. I mean, it's just taken lumps out of the, the advantage that Frank Stippler has in third place. Getting to the rear of the ID, the danger is Frank Stippler will go very defensive and it will cause a... Ten, it cause a uh, Fred Makovicki to lose the momentum and that's what Makovicki has got right now is momentum and that's why he's running down he's using every inch of the racetrack and the curb and he seemingly is doing it with what two two and a half seconds lap advantage over the RD in front this will be great news for Makovicki if he can get past Stippler because then he'll be in third position for the grid later on today with two cars in front that unquestionably in the dry don't have the McLaren's pace qualifying proved that the Mercedes and the Audis are slower than the McLarens in pure dry pace here though comes Fred Makovicki it's going to be into turn 14 then he'll have a little nose up the inside and try and get the best drive possible out of that oh, corner and, I mean, the stipper let the back of the Audi really slide out over the curb again you don't need that now the cars ahead may well come into play if this is not the last lap we're waiting to see whether this will be the last lap or whether there'll be one more to go as they come across the stripe. I think this will be now the final lap of the race that they're about to start. Into the final corner they come. Fred Makovicki right out behind. 40 seconds to go as they cross the line. So this is the battle for the first place on the second row of the grid later on today. Through turn one they come and it's only going to be a matter of time. Stippler's going to have to defend for all his life is worth now he's going to have to take the inside line into pretty much every corner and even that might not be enough because Makovicki has got such good grip in that McLaren through the long right-hander at turn three Stippler going slower just so he can keep the nose in but it's not going to be long they're coming up to the back of 
the number 10 car, which is now going to be in the hands of Arman Ibrahim. How's that going to pan out for them as they're going to meet him on the run up into turn nine? Through they come. And look how much the ID is sliding in how stable the McLaren in comparison looks. But again, it's just about getting the car into position. Stippler, what he needs to do is slow the Audi down on the entry to a corner to deliberately slow down the McLaren and then get back on the throttle and open that gap. But Fred McAvicki is combative as a driver, looks to try and stick it down the inside. That was ambitious and it really was never going to be viable. He's really got now three corners in which he can get the job done, but he hasn't been able to. Stippler has stopped every every move, counter counter played if you like and now coming out onto the back straight this is the last time can he get a drive up the long straight into turn 15 but here comes Stefano Telli to take the checker flag and Audi's first win since Nagaro back in the opening round in April fantastic work from them but down the back straight second place is going to be the 38 car but here's the move going into the final corner he's going to try and get the cut back it's Fred Makovicki it's not going to be enough it will be third position just about for the Audis you can hear the delight on the uh, in the pit garage and they finish in third position ahead of the McLaren in four, fifth place for the 37 Mercedes of Thomas Jaeger at the wheel of that car. He and Nicky Passarelli finishing in fifth. There you can see Armand Ibrahim in the Ford GT. They got involved in that incident earlier on. And well, what an enthralling race that was. We had action all over the shop. There you can see Alvaro Parent coming across the line ahead of the uh, 17 BMW in seventh place. Eighth place overall, and our GT3 race winner is the Heiko Gravity Shiru car, Dominic Bauman and Maximilian Buch, side by side between the BMW and the Ferrari across the line. Enzo Eid almost putting... No, that's just Lappery again, isn't it? I apologize. Yama Berman a long, long way down in the finishing order. He comes across the line and it is a 19th place. Tony Volander actually set the fastest lap of the race on that last lap. 137.794. So Slick's definitely the thing to be on at the end of the race. Not at the midpoint. It's a win for Stefano Telli and Laurence Fanthor. It doesn't. It gives them a, a decent chunk of points. Eight points for them. More importantly, it gives them pole position for the championship race. Normally we have qualifying Saturday, championship race Sunday, but today we've got a bumper schedule here at the Moscow Raceway and the championship race is this afternoon. It, we get underway with it at three o'clock local time, which is four hours ahead of GMT. So it'll be four o'clock here, oh, sorry, three o'clock here, therefore 12 o'clock in the UK. 1 p.m. in Europe and 12 o'clock GMT. I hope that's, uh, sorry, 11 o'clock GMT. I hope that's clear for you. All the timings are on the GT1 World website if I've offered you any particular confusions about when the race is on later today. Pulling into second place then is the 38 car of Mark Basseng and Marcus Winkelhock. Great job from them. They always manage to find the speed. They always manage to pull out, well, not the speed, but the results. They just always end up with the results. And that's why they're in such strong position in the championship. But there's Ortelli and Van Thorpe. They won the very first race of this 2012 GT1 season. And Steph Dusseldorp has tweeted already about uh, his race. I can't understand Dutch, so I don't know what he said exactly, but he's right on the money already there's Ortelli and Van Thorpe thumbs up from Van Thorpe a little chat between Stippler and Philippe Dumas Philippe Dumas by the looks of it not happy with Stippler's defending of the Hexus McLaren that would be my guess that buzzer you can hear going off is to let people know that cars are coming into the pit lane Hopefully that's, uh, that will stop when, uh, well, now, when the cars come into the pit. So, Ortelli and Stibler now having a chat.
thumbs up between the pair and that's good to see because those two had an absolutely brilliant battle well we saw both of the Mercedes battling each other brilliantly really entertaining stuff in that race great battles for the lead and there will be a happy pairing Mark Basseng and Marcus Finkelhock how they managed to pull out some of these results I do not know but they keep calm they keep their head they race very well indeed and they're second in the championship now only 10 points behind Michael Bartels and Yama Berman and with such a poor weekend so far for Bartels and Berman we could see Bassang and Vingelok leading the championship all they need to do is pick up a fifth place in the championship race and they would be well they'd be level on points and Bartels and Berman would be ahead because they had the most wins but if uh, if from second on the grid Bassang and Vingelok can convert it into a top four finish then they will be leading the championship Bassang and Vingelhock shake hands uh, sorry Bassang and Jarvis and then Vingelhock and Jarvis great camaraderie here in GT1 that's one thing that you do enjoy these are all racers who know they're at the top of their game and who are just enjoying racing fantastic cars in fantastic new venues here's a look at the results then it's the Audi R8 for Audi Sport Team WRT taking the victory Stefano Telly and Lawrence Van Thorpe winning by 9.5 seconds over Marcus Vingelock and Mark Vassang. Frank Stippler and Oliver Jarvis in third place, just holding off Fred Makovicki behind him and Steph Dusseldorf finishing in fourth place. This will also set the grid for the championship race later on today. The top six pick up points, but not points of massive note, even though every single point will count. Mayor Melnoff and Lauda in seventh place. They recovered quite well, actually. It'll be interesting to see how well they can go in the dry. Eden Castellacci in eighth, Volander and Salaquada in ninth, Yama Berman and Michael Bartels, tenth position for them. Really interested to go and chat to them after the race to find out exactly what happened. Aman Ibrahim and Benjamin Larish. Ibrahim's first ever time driving the Ford GT was in free practice. His first ever time in the wet. Must have been very, very tricky. They got caught up in some incidents. Benjamin Larish, notably, in the first lap. But let's hear from Stefan Ortelli and Laurence Vanthor. They're down in Park for May with John Watson. Winners of the initial qualifying race here in the Russian Speedway. La Stefan Ortelli, Laurent Vanthor. Stefan, you had to work very hard in those conditions. Yes, indeed, uh, John. You know, it was uh, a very great car. I think uh, the key of the race was also that Laurent gave me by uh, radio a lot of advice about the line. And I did, uh, from the first lap, use the line he was using because I know he was the quickest on the track before. And... Uh, it gave me the chance to pull away, a bit uh, unlucky with the traffic, but uh, once I was alone, I could pull away and make a big gap. Laurent, you had to make the decision about tyres. You said wet tyres, didn't you? Yeah, I never came here before, but I talked to some friends from my age who are still driving World Series, and they told me it takes a long time to drive the track, uh, and it was still too wet for, to put slicks on. Maybe now in the end it was quicker, but for sure we made the right choice. And Finally, after Nogaro, we are back. OK, now, guys, you're in pole position for the championship race. Hopefully it's going to be dry. It's only going to be as effective in the dry as it certainly is in these conditions. Yeah, I think the, the dry line is there. Uh, if it's there, that is going to be difficult if uh, you are behind to overtake. But the car is also very good on the dry. We have a bit too much on this year, but uh, I think we can cope with it. Uh, it's always better than the oversteer. And the uh, track suits well the, the car, so it's, uh, it's great to be here. OK, we'll have a great race in the championship race, guys. Thank you. So Stefano Zelli and Lawrence Van Thor winning. Fantastic stuff from them. I mentioned that tweet from Steph Dusseldorp earlier on. It has now been translated for me by uh, Girl Talks Racing on Twitter. And apparently Steph said that he didn't have enough for P3, but he's looking forward to the rematch this afternoon. He thinks this afternoon, if the conditions are dry, that the McLarens will be very, very strong and they can win when it matters in the championship race. Now let's hear from our second place men, Marcus Vingelock and Mark Basseng. There were John. Marcus, I can see a look of relief on your face. You must be happy with second. Yeah, yeah, well, incredible. Coming from eight, I was not expecting that. Maybe it was the gap I had with the starting position that I have more time to watch how the grip is. So through the first corners, I uh, could gain a lot of places uh, after first lap P3. But then I just uh, drive behind the Audis and bring it home. And Marcus did a tremendous job. You make it sound so simple. Was it that easy, Marcus? He says he just did an easy, you know, got you, gave you the car. You could do the best. <laughs> Uh, no, I have to say the car was really good. Uh, I expected it worse uh, because the conditions were not really easy, but 
uh, he did a good, really good uh, first lap. I think he gained three or four positions. Um, pit stop went well, and yeah, as I said, the car was really good from the first lap on. I could push immediately. Um, I was not sure how the rain tire, where the drop will be until the end of the race, but actually it was okay. I could I could push until the end of the, uh, end of the race, and I'm just happy about the second place. Excellent front row of the grid for the champions race. See you guys later. So they will start in second position on the outside line, I think it is, pole position on the run down into the first corner. And that's going to be an interesting battle, I think, when we get a proper start of, obviously, today's race started behind the safety car. And now, finally, the second Audi on the podium, Oliver Jarvis and Frank Stippler. Oliver Jarvis, we thought it was going to be a one-two for Audi, but it wasn't to be. No, unfortunately, it looked like we struggled in the closing stages as the track dried, but uh, Frank did a fantastic job to keep the McLaren behind on the last lap. And, you know, we come away with a podium. We started fifth. Uh, good starting position for, you know, the race later today. Frank, I thought all your historic racing experiences, you're going to be the man here. You would have driven in any condition. Yeah, um, in, the, in the beginning, the car was quite good uh, for the first three laps, and then it reached its peak already and um, dropped a lot in the rear, especially. Um, so it was oversteering like hell in the end, or right from the beginning after four laps roundabout after the fight with uh, Stefan. And um, yeah, then I had tried to, to keep the safe uh, the, the rear tires um, somehow, and uh, uh, it was it was difficult to drive like a nail in the front bonnet. Well, that battle between Otelli and you for those four or five laps was magic. Heart mouth time for Pio Dudone. What can you do in the, in the uh, championship race? Uh, we can go out and enjoy it and hopefully win it. I mean, depends what the weather's going to do, but, you know, we're not fighting for the championship anymore, so we can go give it everything, take, take some risk and have some fun. Typical Oli Jarvis answer. Thanks, guys. See you later. So there's our third place finishes. Thanks to John Watson for chatting to them down there in Park Ferme. And he'll go off for a little handshake as well. So there's the GT3 winner, the 101 car of Dominic Bauman and Maximilian Buch. And let's have a look at how that race finished. The Mercedes Benz winning of Bauman and Buch, as we expected, 23 and a half seconds clear of their nearest rivals, which was David Mengsdorf and Harry Project in the Lamborghini Gallardo from Rhino's Life at Motorsports. In third place, Gaetano Ardagna Perez and Giuseppe Ciro doing a great job to come from their lower down starting position to end up finishing in third. Sirabin and Guidi Alessandro in fourth position. The Amarim and Cesar Campanico fifth. Michael Lines and Stefano Guy didn't really do their championship hopes any help with a sixth position. A little bit of a struggle for them today in the second AF Corsa car. Miguel Toril and Sergei Rybov in seventh place. You can see my even lady again got into a bit of an incident of Max Nielsen spinning out very early on in this race. A real surprise to see Max struggling so much. But he and Mika Vahamaki not picking up a finish. So an entertaining opening race here at Moscow Raceway. And here is the FIA GT3 European Championship podium. Dominic Bauman and Maximilian Buch on the top step. It is their fourth win of the season. Second place goes to Harry Prochik and David Mengsdorf. That is their fourth second place of the season. And third place, Giuseppe Ciro and Gaetano Adagna Perez. And Dominic Bauman and Maximilian Boot driving for Heiko Gravity Chiruz. And there is the team representative of Heiko Gravity Chiruz. And the Czech team will hear the Czech national anthem on the podium. So congratulations to our top six drivers there on the podium. 
And the trophy is being awarded to our Dagna Perez and Giuseppe Ciro. They're still in the championship hunt, but they just keep losing out to Bauman and Book. Bauman and Book have yet to put together a really good weekend since Nagaro. Third and first in Nagaro, but Zolga they had a fifth, Navarro they had an eighth, and Algarve they had another fifth. They haven't been able to run up the points quite as strongly as they would want. David Mengsdorf and Harry Prochik. David Mengsdorf really announcing himself as a GT star of the future at the moment. The Rhino's Liper motorsport car performing very strongly. The Lamborghini in mixed conditions. And the race winners, Maximilian Buch and Dominic Bauman. That's their fourth trophy for the top step this season. Apart from the first race in Nagaro and the second race at Zolder, if they've been on the podium, they've won. They tend to either win or have a disaster. It's one of the two. And the award for the bronze driver is going to go to Gaetano Adagna Perez, I believe. They're just pointing him out. And the, uh, well, there goes the trophy, first of all, to Heiko Gravesy Chiruz. Congratulations to them. So, another impressive weekend for Gravity Sheru. They have such a commanding. Well, this will move them now into the lead of the championship because they, of course, the Ferrari didn't have a particularly strong afternoon. There's only two points between them coming into this weekend. Not exactly how the sure how the team standings are now. And there goes the rookie. The sorry, the bronze trophy for Gaetano Adagna Perez. But yeah, of course, in Heiko Gravity Series, in a real battle for the team's championship in FIA GT3. There you can see the podium off to the right-hand side. There's a quite a collection of people down, be down below as they spray the champagne on the podium. So the second race for them and the championship race for GT1 will come up this afternoon. It will be getting underway. Well, in exactly three hours from now, we'll be about five minutes into the race. So must, you must come back and join us then. Here's the Drivers' Championship then. The gap is down to 10 points up at the top. Steph Dusseldorf and Fred Makovicki pick up a couple of points to take them to 85. Only three points for them. But they're still just about in with the shout. But that poor weekend at Slovakia ring really, really hurt them. The marshals go off for their lunch break. Everyone here goes off for their lunch break as well. But we'll be back with the championship race a little bit later on today. Here's how the team's championships line up. And Al Inkle, really with a commanding lead up at the top, the difficult afternoon for Vita for one, means that they are starting to be caught now by Belgian Audi Club. After that strong performance, Hex is racing. Decent effort from them, but nothing particularly spectacular. AF Corsa, fifth place in the team's championship. So let's have a little look at the highlights. It started behind the safety car, but when the safety car came in, Philippe Salaquada was a man on the mission. The front two outbroke each other going into the first corner. That allowed Oliver Jarvis to move into the lead. There was a collision further back. Salaquada getting together with Gregoire de Moussier. Steph Dusseldorp and Nicky Pastorelli also had some decent scraps going out onto the start, finished straight. And it was all sorts of mayhem. A little bit of a, a tap there for the 102 car of Max Nilsson. He was helped into a spin. Couldn't stop the car before he ended up in the gravel trap facing the wrong way. Contact between one of the GT3 cars and the 10 GT1 car. That was Benjamin LaRiche being tapped around. But the battles in GT1 continued and continued. And there's an example of uh, Thomas Jaeger trying to force out Enzo Ede. Out of the pit lane they came, and it was very, very close. And in the end, the BMW decided to go on to slick tyres, and it really didn't work out for them. Yama Berman struggling to get any kind of time. They ended up finishing down in 19th place. We had an absolutely mega battle for the lead between the two teammates. Here, Lawrence Van Thor dived to the inside with Oliver Jarvis trying to go around the outside, but it didn't quite work out for them. They remained side by side for the remainder of the lap. It really was a thrilling race between the pair of them. But in the end, 
it was Lawrence Van Thor and Stefano Telly, as they did in Nagaro in the first round, who came out on top of their teammates. So three hours until the next championship race. We hope you can join us then. Thank you for joining us here at the Moscow Raceway.